If you've spent any length of time in Italy, you may have noticed something interesting. There appear to be two police forces. This is true, at least to an extent. There's the Polizia, which is the national police force and looks very much like other police forces around Europe and the rest of the world. And then there are the Carabinieri, who have a more military organization, similar to that of the French Gendarmerie or the Spanish Guardia Civil and wear distinctive uniforms with white shoulder belts when on patrol and elaborate ceremonial outfits when on parade. Most visitors won't, or hopefully won't, have many dealings with local law enforcement officers, so you probably won't notice too many differences between the two forces. However, the Carabinieri has a fascinating history which is well worthy of further exploration. We'll be touching on that history in this video, but the main focus will of course be the Second World War, a time when the Carabinieri supported the fascists and exerted domestic control for their leader, Benito Mussolini, until a neck-breaking about-face saw Il Duce toppled from power. This is a story of shifting allegiances and a complex balance of power. This is the story of the Carabinieri during World War II, the conflict's most flexible, adaptable, or perhaps unstable military police force, depending on your viewpoint. While you're here with us, we'd like to invite you to explore our Ko-fi page. If you don't know what Ko-fi is, it's essentially Patreon without all the censorship and political baggage. Your support on Ko-fi directly fuels our ability to produce unique and exciting content that might otherwise remain hidden in the depths of the YouTube algorithm. In fact, some of our existing videos, like the ones on the Chaco War, the Beagle Conflict, and Morris Cohen's incredible journey, haven't received the recognition we believe they truly deserve. But we're determined not to shy away from such important topics even if they might not align with the algorithm's preferences for promotion. With your support on Kofi, we can give videos like these a second chance, ensuring that these valuable stories and insights reach a wider audience without any concerns about our profitability month by month. We also haven't forgotten to include some awesome weekly and monthly perks for our supporters, so make sure you check out the link below. To understand the role of the Carabinieri during World War II, we first need to go back. Way back, actually. Before the beginning of the conflict in 1939, before the First World War that ravaged the continent decades earlier, before the very founding of the country we know today as Italy, we need to go all the way back to 1814 and to the twilight of Napoleon's European Empire. At the beginning of 1814, the Italian peninsula and its islands was split between four kingdoms. The Kingdom of Italy in the northeast, the Kingdom of Naples in the south, and the kingdoms of Sicily and Sardinia off the western coast. The remainder of the peninsula was in French hands, either as contiguous French territory and the Principality of Lucca in the west, or the French-held Illyrian provinces in the east. By March, Napoleon's empire was crumbling and the Italian map was about to grow far more complicated. The kingdom of Lombardo Veneto emerged in the north, while the Papal states replaced much of what had been the Kingdom of Italy. The duchies of Modena, Lucca, Massa e Carrara, and Parma emerged, along with the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. Much of the northwest, including Turin and Monaco, became part of the Kingdom of Sardinia. This fractured landscape wouldn't coalesce into modern Italy for another 56 years. It was in Sardinia that our story begins for real. The Sardinian king, concerned by the apparent instability of a changing land, sought protection with a new kind of armed force. Not quite an army, not quite a civil police or security force, this new body would be somewhere between the two, a militarized unit capable of keeping the peace and sustaining order. They would be armed with a carabina, a kind of rifle, so they became known as the carabinieri. Today, more than 200 years later, Carabinieri units still carry out duties in Italian cities and across the country, working alongside, but separately from, the more orthodox Polizia units. Their motto, Ne Secoli Fedele, translates as faithful throughout the centuries in English, appropriate enough for a force that is older than the nation it now serves. Tradition, nationalism and loyalty have always been at the heart of the Carabinieri identity. Fast forward more than 100 years. 
The unified Italy is now on the global stage and has fought bloody campaigns in the greatest conflict the world had ever seen up to that point. She may have emerged victorious from World War I, but Italy had come pretty close to defeat when Austro-Hungarian troops swept into the northeast in 1917, and around 1.25 million Italians are believed to have perished in the war. Among those wounded in the First World War was a young socialist newspaper editor and political activist by the name of Benito Mussolini. At the war's end, Mussolini had forgotten all about his left-wing leanings and was veering increasingly rightwards, envisioning a militaristic, rigidly structured state with a single dictator based on the evocative imagery of the imperial days of ancient Rome. This vision, he hoped, would launch Italy into greatness. Only three years later, Mussolini was elected to the Chamber of Deputies, the lower of Italy's two parliamentary chambers. The following year, in 1922, his supporters rallied in alarming numbers, descending, fully armed, on the capital. King Victor Emmanuel III was sufficiently rattled by the unrest and opted to dissolve his government, avoiding potential bloodshed, but essentially handing power to Mussolini. By October, Mussolini was the new Prime Minister, and Italy's fascist era began. Although, in fact, it had already begun. 1921 and 1922 are known as the Bienio Nero, or the two black years in Italian history, due to the violence meted out by fascist groups on trade unions, socialists, and anyone else they deemed incompatible with the dream of a new Italy. As early as 1919, the Fasci di Combattimento, sometimes known as fighting leagues in the literal English translation, but better known as fascists, burned down the offices of the socialist daily newspaper Lavanti, or Ford. This was the very same publication on which Mussolini had himself served as an editor in 1912. Upon coming to power, the fascist party still had their fighting leagues, but they had other instruments of violence too official instruments of governmental control, like the Carabinieri. The Carabinieri, spurred on by their commitment to the nation of Italy, no matter who was in charge, went about their new tasks with gusto. They suppressed opposition forces and provided the domestic muscle that Mussolini and his government needed to exert control across the country. But this was no ordinary police force. They had overseas duties to attend to as well. Carabinieri units were involved in actions in Italy's East African colonies in modern-day Ethiopia and Eritrea, often using extreme violence to get their point across. When the Second World War broke out in 1939, the role of the Carabinieri expanded once again, and they served as military police wherever Italian forces were in action. They were also key to the suppression of the Yugoslav partisans in the occupied Balkans. Although these anti-partisan activities would eventually fail, they showed the lengths that the Carabinieri were prepared to go in order to maintain rigid order in Italian-controlled lands. As much as Mussolini may have wanted them to be so, the Carabinieri were not Il Duce's private police force. They served Italy, not Mussolini. They served the nation, not the doctrine of fascism. By the summer of 1943, the end was fast approaching for Mussolini and it would be the Carabinieri who would hasten his demise. On July 9th, Allied forces, fresh from victory in North Africa, landed on Sicily, overrunning the island and occupying the first piece of Italian heartlands ahead of the long advance north. Ten days later, more than 500 Allied bombers began to pound Rome, killing around 1,500 people and shattering industrial and logistical infrastructure. The idea of evacuating southern Italy was raised, but this catastrophic strike on the capital underlined the gravity of the situation. The war was coming to an end for Italy, and fighting on would be suicide for a nation still less than a century old. Late on July 24th, the Grand Council of the Fascist Government called a desperate meeting. As the hours wore on, it became clear to all in attendance that Mussolini was a broken man. Like Stalin in the Soviet Union, this had been a leader who had inspired great fear in his subordinates, but this seemed a different Mussolini altogether. In the early hours of July 25th, council member Dino Grandi summoned the courage to make a bold proposal. The dictatorship must end, 
and power must be split between the dictator and the king. One by one, the other council members voted. The vote was not unanimous, but the decision came out in Grandi's favor. Mussolini was said to have barely reacted as his once unimpeachable power was dissolved before his very eyes. Only 20 minutes later, Mussolini met with King Victor Emmanuel at the private royal residence in Rome. This was a regular meeting in which Mussolini would update the king on matters of state, but this time it was the king who was breaking the news. General Pietro Bagdolio would be the new prime minister, the king told a disheveled and exhausted Mussolini, and a peace process would begin. Emerging from the royal quarters into the gathering heat of a Roman day, Mussolini was met by a group of uniformed men who promptly placed him under arrest. These men were a unit of the Carabinieri. Mussolini's trusted Gendamari had turned against him. The Allied invasion of Sicily was all over by August 17th, and the new Prime Minister, General Bagdolio, wasted no time in making his next move. Without the knowledge of his increasingly distant German partners, Badoglio reached out to General Eisenhower on August 19th. The agreed armistice was signed at Casabile in Sicily on September 3rd, and unconditional surrender was declared on September 8th. The Italian armed forces were essentially out of the fight, save for a few die-hard units, but vast areas of the Italian peninsula were still under German control and were heavily defended. This included the capital, Rome. While this made things difficult for the Allies, it represented an existential crisis for the Carabinieri. They'd arrested Mussolini and helped to bring about the armistice and surrender. Many Carabinieri even decided to fight alongside the Allies in the ongoing campaign northwards. The Carabinieri Command for Liberated Italy was founded at Bari and began reorganizing into cohesive fighting groups to assist the Allied war effort. But this was in the south of the country, the Kingdom of Italy. It was a very different situation in the north, where Hitler had reinstated Mussolini as Italy's fascist leader, following an audacious rescue from the Gran Sasso in the Apennine Mountains. On October 16th, German forces occupied Rome, cementing control of the Socialist Republic, a remnant of fascist Italy that still existed in the north. While Romans had endured more than a decade of fascism, that had not been yet touched by the Nazis' own brand of far-right doctrine. Rome's Jewish community, for example, had remained largely safe from persecution during the Holocaust, but this was not the case anymore. Visiting Rome today, you may encounter gold plaques mounted on the pavement, inscribed with names and dates, poignant reminders of the hundreds of Roman Jews who were rounded up when the Nazis took over and sent off to die in the concentration camps. There had been talk of a joint allied Italian mission to take Rome in the first weeks after the fall of Sicily, but this never came to pass. Instead, two of the remaining Italian forces attempted to resist the occupation. The Granatieri di Sardinia mechanized brigade regiments and the Carabinieri cadet battalion. Italian fascism was something these men could just about accept, but German Nazism was very different. Despite their efforts, the resistance failed and the Carabinieri had signed their now death warrant. The German occupiers in the north initially tried to incorporate the Carabinieri into a new National Republican Guard, but distrust was high. After the betrayal of Mussolini, the Carabinieri could no longer be relied upon as ardent defenders of fascism. The resistance of Rome only underlined this issue. The Carabinieri were disarmed en masse and some 8,000 were deported to German forced labor camps. 8,000 is a lot of men, but it only scratched the surface of the Carabinieri ranks. In the north, those who escaped the deportation joined the resistance, fighting guerrilla actions against the German occupiers and against their pro-fascist Italian countrymen. In the south, around 45,000 officers continued their roles, carrying out national security duties in the Kingdom of Italy. There were other actions too. After the fall of Italy, many Carabinieri were essentially stranded in Yugoslavia. Rather than risk ending up in German detention and labor camps, many joined the resistance over there too. The Italian 182nd Armored Infantry Regiment, known as the Garibaldi in honor of the 19th century hero of Italian unification, 
was comprised of former Karabinieri men and fought with astonishing bravery alongside Yugoslavian partisans against the Wehrmacht and the Croatian Axis forces. More than 80% of the Garibaldi would lose their lives in the fighting and the entire regiment was awarded the Silver Medal of Military Valor. There were other stories of heroism too. Salvo da Quisto was a Carabinieri with the rank of Vice Brigadiere. Following the killing of a German soldier, enraged occupying forces prepared to massacre local civilians in response. Da Quisto, appalled by what his former comrades were about to do, stepped forward and took full responsibility for the killing. The civilians were spared, while Da Quisto was put to death at Palidoro near Rome. Long after the armistice, the war dragged on in northern Italy. This was not token resistance from the Axis either. The Battle of Monte Cassino in May 1944 was one of the costliest engagements of the entire war, resulting in almost 200,000 casualties. Despite this, the game was almost up by the spring of 1945. Badoglio had gone behind German backs in 1943 and negotiated peace with Eisenhower, and now it was the Germans' turn to do the same. At a meeting with partisan leaders in Milan on April 25, 1943, Mussolini discovered that the Nazis were planning to betray him as part of an unconditional surrender. Incensed, Mussolini fled from Milan with his mistress, Clara Petacci, that same day. Two days later, on the 27th, Mussolini and Petacci were arrested, taken to the shores of Lake Como, lined up against the wall, and shot to death. The famous photograph of the former leader and his girlfriend hanging by their ankles from the rafters of a petrol station in Milan was taken on April 29th. They'd been beaten, spat on, pelted with vegetables, and shot repeatedly before being strung up. Eight months earlier, the bodies of 15 executed partisans had been publicly displayed in this very same square. The bloody fury of this symbolism would form part of the basis for the reconstruction and rebirth of Italy after the war. While the Carabinieri had certainly been complicit in the repression of Mussolini's political opposition both before and during the war, it was their role in the conflict's final months that would shape what came next. Resisting Nazi occupation and assisting Allied troops in the War of Liberation redeemed the reputation of the force and the Carabinieri was re-established as Italy looked forward to a new age of hope, peace, and prosperity. In the years since the Second World War, the Carabinieri have remained on the front line of law enforcement and public safety in Italy. From 1968 to 1988, Carabinieri units served alongside police, the armed forces, and special operatives as far-left and far-right terror groups brought political violence back to Italy. Known as the Years of Lead, Terrorist actions and political upheaval claimed 428 lives, including 15 of the Carabinieri. Between 1981 and 1984, the Carabinieri sought to bring an end to the killing as the Corleonese Mafia clan went to war with the Inzario, Bontate and Baldamente crime families in a dark chapter of Italian post-war history known as the Matanza or Slaughter. As the violence got increasingly out of hand, the mobsters expanded the scope of the killing, carrying out attacks on governmental and law enforcement targets. Emanuele Vassili, Mario Di Alio Giuseppe Bomarito, and Pietro Morici, all Cabinieri captains, were murdered, as was Marshal Giuliano Guazzelli. In more recent years, the Carabinieri has served overseas, carrying out peacekeeping missions in Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, where the force lost 12 officers in a 2003 suicide attack on their base in Basra. While the modern-day Carabinieri is more likely to be found assisting in public security and policing, elite units have continued to offer support to security forces outside of Italy, including offering training to Iraqi law enforcement and protecting sites of cultural heritage under threat from ISIS operations. The Carabinieri were awarded their first silver and bronze medals of military valor at the battles of Pastreño and St. Lucia in spring 1848, as the Kingdom of Sardinia took on the Austrian Empire. Since then, the force has added four more silver medals, three more bronze, and three gold medals of military valor, along with countless other military and civilian honors. In a history that stretches back 200 years, the Carabinieri has made huge sacrifices in the service first of Sardinia and then of a unified Italy, 
and has become highly decorated as a result. It's easy to view the Carabinieri's actions between 1922 and 1943 through modern eyes. Taken at face value, this period of the force's history seems like one of opportunism. The Carabinieri were complicit in the mayhem and repression under Mussolini and carried out their orders with ruthless efficiency. When it became clear they had backed a losing horse, they jumped ship. They sided with the Allies, at least in most cases, and they ended up on the winning side. But this is probably unfair and is certainly too simplistic. Firstly, this view discounts what the Carabinieri were all about. Faithful throughout the centuries. This does not mean remaining faithful to one man and bending to his whims. It's something bigger than this. It relates to duty, to nationhood, to a love of country, culture and identity. When Mussolini rose to power in 1922, a unified Italy was barely 50 years old, and this fledgling nation had veered close to disaster after the capitulation along the banks of the Isonzo in 1917. It was only the resolute defense on the Piave River and the subsequent collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that saved Italy as the First World War reached its end. For the Carabinieri, the nation of Italy must prevail, and the vision of Mussolini may well have seemed like the best way to defend national interests. Once that vision and that man had brought Italy closer to destruction than ever before, with invading armies approaching from the south and an occupying force poised to take control in the north, the Carabinieri knew what they must do to save their country. The immense bravery shown by these men in the months that followed and the suffering so many of them endured demonstrate their commitment to their nation and to its people. Secondly, this view ignores the very nature of warfare the bewildering uncertainty and downright terror of conflict. Shifting allegiances, a complex network of alliances, and an ever-changing balance of power. All these things characterize life and service during wartime. To discount the actions of the Carabinieri is to completely misunderstand the complicated situation these units faced during a period of immense global upheaval. But what do you think? How key were the Carabinieri to the fortunes of Italy during the war? To what extent were they responsible for the rise of Mussolini and for his eventual downfall? Let us know all that and more in the comment section below guys. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.